GearNetwork.com. The following is a presentation of the Gear Radio Network. Hey, this is Raven Black, and you're listening to the All Bets Are Off podcast with Robbie Vegas. What's up, Rock Soldiers? This is the rock star Robbie Vegas with another fresh, brand new episode of the All Bets Are Off podcast. And today we have Jeffrey Weisman on the show. And all you Back to the Future fans already know he played George McFly in parts two and three. But did you also know he was in Twilight Zone the movie, Saved by the Bell, Pale Rider with Clint Eastwood, and the list goes on and on and on. And we're going to get into that today. And also, we took a portion of this interview and put it on YouTube because it is video. And he shows behind-the-scenes pictures from Twilight Zone and Back to the Future. And uh, I thought it was something that you guys would really like, really enjoy. So after you're done listening, if you want to see any of the stuff that we're talking about, there will be some video on YouTube. Again, not the full interview. So if you want the full interview, click that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app, and you're going to get that right here. And make sure you're following us for all of our updates, ABAO Pod, across the board on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're on all three. And I want to thank everybody who listened to my interview on the Confessionals podcast. Uh, this was not a standard interview. If you listen to it, you know this is a paranormal podcast. It was uh, talking about my paranormal experiences and cryptid encounter on a wrestling road trip. So all you new followers out there and all you new listeners who came from the Confessionals podcast, thank you for joining us if it's your first time. And we hope that you enjoy this interview with Jeffrey Weissman. So let's get him on the line right now. Everybody. This is Lauren Marie Taylor, creator and host of the Not the Final Girl podcast. Okay, so every horror fan remembers the final girl, right? You know, the one who can outrun and outsmart the Jasons, the Michaels, the Chuckies. I think you get it. But what about the girls and, yeah, the guys who met with an untimely end? Those of us who were tortured and tripped, dragged and killed. Don't we deserve some props? As Vicky in Friday the 13th Part 2 and Sheila in Girls Night Out, I know what a drag it is to succumb to those masked and wardrobe-challenged killers to not be the final girl. On my new podcast, I'll be chatting with other women of horror who share the same fate. Special guests include those final girls as well as the writers and directors who created our characters, only to give us an early expiration date. And if they play nice, we'll let some of those crazed killers of horror tell their side of the story. So join me, Lauren Marie Taylor, on the Not the Final Girl podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you get the alerts when the episodes drop. Thanks for listening. Keep your doors locked and stay out of the woods. Jeffrey, thank you so much for doing the podcast today, man. I'm a big fan, and this is really cool for me, so I appreciate it. Thank you. All bets are off. (laughs) Well, I want to start, before we even start talking Back to the Future, which now my listeners are going, oh, you're going to make us wait? Yes, I am. Because I want to know, what made you want to be an actor to begin with? Uh, Oh, I think uh, just part of my nature. It's it's, I've always, you know, as a kid, Love play acting and doing roles, and you know, I, my sister and I, growing up, would you know play together every kind of uh, role, and to you know monsters for Halloween and in the backyard, with different you know challenges we had for different crazy things we did growing up, and then when we discovered that we could take our allowance and buy music, we would get rock and roll records and act them out, you know, from Janis Joplin to Moody Blues to Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin, you know, we, we acted out the songs often and then Motown and, and anyways, so, uh, in school, uh, being the class clown often, I kind of realized I could parlay that into getting credit for schoolwork. 
Uh, like in history class, I would do a live announcement of the news of the day from ancient Egypt or, you know, the Roman Empire, whatever we were studying. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, and so I got to figure out how to make it all work. And, and my parents, you know, were in the fringes of show business. My dad had a club that he partnered with at one point with Lauren Green from Bonanza. And uh, it was a private gambling club for bridge and backgammon players. And I'd go to the club with him and I'd meet, you know, I remember my first haircut. I was probably seven or eight years old at his club in Beverly Hills and at his barber and sitting in the chair next to me was Cesar Romero, who I knew, you know, from the Batman series. I was like, oh, this is cool. And I, uh, from time to time, see actors on location where I live shooting episodes of the FBI or whatever. I go and insert myself and uh, assert myself and meet these actors. I'm going to be an actor. And they didn't, though, want me to be an actor. My dad had seen actors mainly gambling and swearing and drinking at his club. And my mom was a bail bonds woman. She bailed actors out of jail, like Lenny Bruce and others. Anyway, so they wouldn't let me really, they said, your schoolwork's too important. Uh, and we're, no, they, they weren't going to let me act professionally, but they let me do it in school. Mm -hmm. And then also I would, like I say, find myself in opportunities. I hear Mel Brooks is shooting something in my neighborhood when I was 14 and when sort of hung out where I thought the shoot was going on and finally saw people in Victorian evening wear and a gentleman's mustache was flapping. I said, sir, your mustache is coming. I said, oh, is it? Who are you? I said, I'm an actor. <laughs> and he said, oh, really? What have you done? And I would say, you know, whatever Shakespeare or popular plays I was doing in, in junior high and high school. And he says, really? You want to meet Mel? I was like, yes, Mel Brooks. <laughs> and so he took me to where they were shooting the, uh, uh, the this, a wonderful gentleman uh, took me to meet Mel at the Great American Music Hall where they were shooting the putting on the Ritz number. And uh, I, I kind of have come full circle because uh, one of the first people I met on the set was Marty Feldman, who was in his street clothes. And I, I was impressed because he was wearing a man bag. <laughs> and I'd never seen an adult man with a purse, a purse, whatever. And uh, a few years ago, I played Igor, in the musical version of Young Frankenstein on stage, in a fantastic production. We had such a great cast. And and I wear a man bag. So it's like come full circle, <laughs> you know, 50 years late. 50 years. Wow. 40. Long time. That was that must have been 73. And uh, and I did the production probably in 2000, uh, 2019. Oh, so wow. Back. Anyway, um, oh, so, so when I got out of school... I finally, you know, said I'm going to get my foot on on a major mo motion picture set in front of a camera. And the only way I could really figure out how to do that was by signing up with a group, a company that would put you in as background in rock and roll concert scenes or big, big crowd scenes in films and stuff, Yeah, which was okay. So I just needed to get on the set and see what it's all about and start learning and loved it. You know, and I started working on FM and The Rose with Beth Midler, uh, FM was a blast working with Martin Mull, and the crowd scene in I Want to Hold Your Hand outside the Beatles Hotel Room in New York in uh, 63, whatever, Zemeckis was directing. And it's supposed to be January in the freezing cold in New York, and we were in 105 degree temperature in Burbank in the sound state, uh, back in the studio lot. And <laughs> people are bundled up, and these extras are dropping like flies. You remember these different stories that come back everyone had to give get tickets to get your meal from the caterer because there was a guy no that was on fm i'm sorry there was someone disgruntled ex-employee or teamster or someone who was living on the back lot beating up the security people and the cleaning people and eating with the crews and cast of different films so you had to get a ticket oh to get your food or... <laughs> anyway my, my big break doing that kind of work came when, when i got to be brainwashed by alice cooper in sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band with peter frampton the Bee Gees. now I wanted to ask you about that specifically. <laughs> so, well, before we even get into the the Alice Cooper brainwashing thing, so you did the I Want to Hold Your Hand and then on to Sgt. Peppers. Now, were you already a fan of the Beatles? You said you and your sister used to do the rock and roll. Like, oh, hell yeah. Yeah, okay. Course. So that well, had to be... You know, a, we, our older brother and sister were, you know, 9 and 11 years older than us. Oh. And so summer of... 65, 66, 66, whenever we go to the beach and listen to KHJ or KFWB, you know, the popular stations in LA, 
it was all Beatles all the time. You right. know, some Stones once in a while or Donovan or something snuck in, but it was mostly uh, that British invasion stuff. And so we were weaned on the Beatles and of course heartbroken when they broke up. And, and it was very cool to be uh, part of that first, I want to hold your hand Beatles theme film. And then to go work on Sergeant Peppers. And I, I you know, I liked the early Bee Gees somewhat at that time. I remember as, I was only a teenager, and I thought the early stuff was was cool, but the later falsetto shit I just could not get into. And yet here I was now working on a film that they're starring in as <laughs> right. the Beatles. And Peter Frampton leaving Humble Humble Pie was like, no, that's sacrilege. But he was such a big <laughs> pop hit. And so it was kind of cool. I remember one of the first days on the, on the soundstage at 7.30 in the morning, I think I had just gotten through makeup, and I smelled pot. And, you know, at 18 years old, 17 or 18, whatever I was, I had my nose trained for smelling pot. Okay, I was following my nose. And it took me to Barry Gibb. And I was like, you're smoking pot this early? And he goes, yeah, you want some? You know. And I was like, oh, far out. You know, like, ah, there's tobacco in this. And he goes, yeah, yeah we like it. Okay. And I remember Robin coming over shortly thereafter. He said, man, brother, brother, we're number one in the Billboard charts. And I was the first to congratulate him for it. Their album what was it News of the World. Oh, that's fantastic! Children of the World. I was first to congratulate them for making the charts, uh, and uh, anyway, it was really in the long run not fulfilling as an actor to do extra work. Yeah. It was cool to be on the set and rub elbows with the celebs, and, and I, I remember really kind of being very attracted to this one blonde dancer that we, I worked with for a couple of days in the Alice Cooper's brainwashing scene, the Boy Scouts. Yeah. And doing the dance number that sort of bumped me up as a dancer from an extra. And Cheryl and I got along enough that by the second day, she would buy me a beer over at the Mexican restaurant across the street from MGM. And I was, I was 18. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> and, uh, so the third morning we had had Alice on the video pre-recorded. And I knew he had been in rehab or whatever. And the third day he was getting out of rehab and he was going to come be on set. Yeah. And it was a very big day. And it was the third day. I remember first thing in the morning, I got onto the set and I saw Cheryl, this dancer, and I ran up to her. And she said, Oh, Jeffrey, hey, I want to introduce you to my husband, Alice. Oh, man. <laughs> nice to meet you. That's amazing. They're still, they're still together, you know. They oh, married, wow. I didn't realize it. You know, they were married, husband and wife. And she's adorable. And they're still <laughs> together. Same thing happened on uh, other films. <laughs> yeah, but so so anyway, uh, finally a, a, uh, a, a artistic director was it Gordon Davidson of the Mark Taper uh, some some casting director or artistic artistic director really drove home the necessity for me to get some good training. I had trained in junior high and doing public theater, community theater, and and also did some stuff at UCLA, even though I was not enrolled there yet. But my, my resume didn't have any good training on it, so they recommended just that. And I set my sights to go to the best training on the West Coast at the time was considered the American Conservatory Theater. So moved kind of north from Los Angeles to the Bay Area in San Francisco with the Renaissance Fairs, which I had worked for a number of years. Yeah. And started doing also the Dickens Fair up in San Francisco, which is a lot of fun. And then uh, while going... I got into ACT and going through my intermediate studies, I fell into an opportunity to screen test for a major motion picture back in Hollywood Mm. from an open call that the director and studio was doing up in the Bay Area and four or five other cities. And out of all those open calls, in fact, I learned that I was the only actor to get a screen test uh, without having an agent, you know, being submitted. Oh, wow. Okay. And, And the day I tested for this film, it was originally called The Genius. They had John, they wanted John Lennon, uh, but that didn't work out uh, because he got killed. But right. and then they had wonderful actor Warren Oates attached, and then he died. Mm-hmm. So the film went into turnaround. They still wanted me to audition or uh, screen test, but they kept putting it off because they weren't sure. The studio MGM and UA had just merged, and they couldn't decide whether they want to do this film, The Genius. And then uh, they got back on track and changed its name to War Games. And Eric Stoltz and Brian Becker and John. Crawford, not Johnny Crawford, John from Christine, John Stockwell. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, Brian Becker, Dana Carvey, and I, we all tested with Ali Sheedy. 
and uh, none of us got it, as we know, but <laughs> but I got a really hot agent out of it and had to move back to L.A. Mm-hmm. And about three months after moving back to L.A., I got a call from that agent to audition for George Miller, who I was a big fan of his Mad Max and Road Warrior films. He was going to do his first Hollywood film. It was going to be a segment of Spielberg's Twilight Zone movie. And I was like, oh, shit, they're going to do that after the accident and all. Yeah, and Spielberg decided he wanted to finish the film. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went in and I got a, got a, a, on very well with George Miller. And before I knew it, I was working with John Lithgow on the airplane with the creature on the wing, you know, the remake of Nightmare at 20,000 feet. Yeah, and uh, that's actually the next thing I wanted to ask you about, too, because I'm a big fan of the Twilight Zone. And, I mean, what was it like just being a part of that? Because at this point, you know, the Twilight Zone was the series. Now you're in the movie. Like, were you a fan of the series prior to being in the movie? Oh, yeah. Yeah? How could you not? If right. you have a brain, <laughs> you gotta be a fan of that series. I, I grew up on it, so and and you know my like I said, my older brother and sister were big influences on me, and so they watched anything cool on TV, whether it was when the Beverly Hillbillies came out or Hullabaloo or you know any of the rock shows, but then the hip shows like uh, Get Smart or Green, Green Acres or the Adams Family, or and Twilight Zone was in there, of course, and the yeah. Outer Limits were in the mix, and. Uh, so I was, you know, I was dubious, of course, because of the horrible accident on the on Landis's segment. But I, I wanted to work, and and I knew that segment very, very really well uh, from you know being a fan of Star Trek and William Shatner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, here is, but that, so that's uh, Charles as the cop, and I think Donna Dixon's in that shot. Yeah. As the stewardess, uh, with John being subdued, his character is such a mess at that point. There it is. And I'm in the big hair with the white carnation. Back yeah, there. right, right. Oh, my God. How cool is that? Wow. Um, I can see if I can switch this up. I haven't quite perfected my zooming slideshow <laughs> <laughs> abilities. But this is, uh, you know, behind the set. Yeah. Me doing John's care. You know, it's not all the way. <laughs> That's Funny fantastic. Thing happened during the shoot, I got scratched by a kitten. My girlfriend at the time's cat had had kittens. And in the middle of the night, I felt this terrible pain in my arm and lifted my arm and a kitten was hanging from it. And I just, get off. <laughs> the next day, I developed this cyst in my elbow. Oh, no. A lot of the time, they put me in the back of the plane because Alan Davio, who died of COVID just over a year ago, mm-hmm. got rest of the cinematographer, wanted to put the camera where my seat was across from John. So I had this cyst in my elbow, and back there were the other extras, like Spaz, this guy with the mohawk from, uh, he had just come off from doing a fight scene with Harrison Ford on uh, Blade Runner, mm-hmm. which got cut. It was not even in the film. Anyway, uh-huh. he was a cool guy. But there was also this old extra, Milton Burl's brother, Jack Burl. He says, that's a cyst in your elbow there, you know. You just rub that, and it'll go away. So I started rubbing it, and it became two cysts. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then I got a lump in my armpit. And then oh. the next day, I remember I was going to go have lunch with, with John at Lithgow at the commissary, and I had these red lines going up my arm and didn't feel so great. So I went to the Warner Brothers nurse instead of going to the commissary with John, and she wrote down an address and said, get to this right now. And it was a doctor a few blocks away, and said, drop your drawers, and gave me three shots of penicillin. And, uh, oh, my God. Yeah, those red lines going up your arm there, I was blood poisoning going towards your heart. Oh, Jesus. Uh, so I had uh, I had cat scratch fever Yeah. Uh, while shooting um, the rest of the film there. Yeah. And the next day, I remember I was going to go have lunch with John Lithgow, and they, we were literally on our way to the commissary, and they called, an assistant called John back to the set to do a special effect. If you look at the film, that segment. Yeah. You know, remember where he, he doesn't want to open that shade on the window. He doesn't want to open. He knows a monster's going to be there. He doesn't want to open that shade, but he can't do it. Yeah. And he finally yeah. does, and the monster's there. Uh, they inserted one shot, which was my lunch with John, of his eyes popping out of his head. Okay, okay. Yeah. So if you freeze frame it right there, you'll see his eyes pop out of his head. Yeah. You know, an old uh, wrestling trick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Instead of scratching the forehead to get the extra blood, <laughs> they put an insert of uh, ping pong <laughs> balls coming out of your... <laughs> I, I saw it. I love it. That's that's fantastic. And you made, and of course, you know, I got along really well with a lot of the the, the cast was like an ensemble because George Miller said if in rehearsal you want to try something, let's go for it. If there's a line or a bit of business or whatever, and we came up with a lot of stuff. 
And there wasn't a lot of time. There was a lot of mayhem. And it was also one of the first times that Garrett Brown, who's six foot six, was brought in his 65 pound steady cam that he invented. Mm-hmm. So you get all those action shots running down the aisles. Right, right. But there was a lot of activity in the, <laughs> the uh, grips and, and, and crew shaking the fuselage all the time and the arc lamps doing the lightning and the, the fog and the uh, effects blowing stuff and props are working their butts off. And, of course, Larry Cedar, who's inside the monster suit, he's out, you know, getting sprayed all the time. They didn't realize that the suit would the paint would come off and disintegrate overnight, the suit. So they were constantly trying to patch the suit. <laughs> and, but, and the excitement, I mean, George Miller is just full of just this charge. He just loves filmmaking so well. You can, he breathes it. And uh, he was so delighted because on the, the uh, lens of the camera, yeah. we were able to tap for one of the first times ever a video Line. You could he could see on a monitor what he was shooting, what the cameraman, what Alan Davio was seeing. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah. he was beyond joy. He was like, <laughs> "Oh, in heaven, I can see what I'm doing." <laughs> and he and he was also directing John to do the opposite of what any actor would do for film. You know, for me as a being weaned on being a ham, I have to bring it in. Yeah. You know, for, because the camera's small, he's teeny tiny, catches everything. Yeah. Whereas you know, John is a big man, and he was weaned on. Broadway and theater and all, he knew he had to bring it in, and George didn't want that. George went the other way. I mean, you got to be big, but bring it here uh-huh. and keep it big. Keep it big. And so John was loving it because it's what he does the best is being big mm-hmm. with his uh, reactions. So because it was a character that allowed him to, and it was justified. It was truthful for the character. Yeah, right. So he was chewing the scenery and just friggin' having a great time. But the third time I was going to have lunch with him, it lost his voice. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'd love to have lunch with you today, but I've got to save what I've got left. You know? <laughs> but I mean, to be fair, you did the film justice while making Ted Nugent proud with your cat scratch fever. So right, I was I was such a Ted fan until he just kind of went nuts. I even did a video once with him and his wife. Did you really? Kid for Kodak as I played characters up at Universal. Yeah, uh, in in about eighty seven, in between film and TV and commercial work. Mm-hmm. My f- first son was was due, and I needed I needed to start making money regularly to raise a family because it, usually that kind of work is infrequent. And you never know, so I needed something steady. Steady. When I heard about, I had a friend who had played Stan Laurel, Laurel and Hardy, and yeah, he asked if I ever had played Stan because he had a role that he was helping cast as a regular cast member at Universal Studios on the tour. I was like, yeah, I, let me get, get me up there. Yeah. As it turned out, I didn't know. Th- shit about doing Stanley correctly (laughs) Uh, from what I remembered of their films as a kid but the actor playing Oliver Hardy saw me with this hiring boss and he turned to the boss and said I know this guy I saw him play Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet in Hollywood and he knocked it out of the park and I can train him he's got talent and so I got hired luckily because the next 15 years I was able to raise my my two sons oh wow that's incredible yeah, and, and still keep working in, in film and TV. Right, of course. So I guess at this point, I kind of want to dig into Back to the Future because I'm I'm curious, were you aware of the iconic role you're stepping into as George McFly? Because Back to the Future was already, like, successful and, you know, it's a big yeah, deal. Yeah, how could I not? I, but, well, first of all, I did a film with Crispin in 83 before he got the first Back to the Future film. Oh, did you really? What film was that? Yeah, it was with Dan O'Hurley. He, we shot it at... Uh, it was an AFI stu- grad student film for his thesis. Oh, okay. They, it, they can use SAG actors for those things. Mm-hmm. And it took place at a boys' school, and Crispin played this kid who was, like, blackmailing or being abused by the pastor head principal of this boys' school. Yeah. And he, and he had a recording of this guy seducing one of the students. Oh, okay. And he played it over the loudspeaker. It was a great, edgy story for for a uh, a student filmmaker to make. And Crispin was, I thought, a fascinating actor and also wore beetle boots. <laughs> and I actually got his phone number and said, you know, I want to stay in touch. And I don't think we had discussed his dad's teaching yet. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, so in 84, I was shooting a uh, Pale Rider with Clint Eastwood. Yeah. And yeah. we turned to Westerns. 
And that came out in 85. And I wanted to see what the other films in 85 competition was. And one of them was Back to the Future. Yeah. So I went to see it. And I was a big fan already of Chris Lloyd and Mike Fox and and lo- fell in love with Leah Thompson. And, and then here came Crispin doing this friggin' great, nerdy, offbeat <laughs> character of George. And, and he stole. Th- I thought he sh- knocked it out of the park. He was brilliant. And I called him either. I left him a message, I remember. But, uh, okay, so flash forward to 88. Yeah. And I'm playing Stan Laurel, and that same agent calls me up and says, do you uh, know who Crispin Glover is? I got a possible job for you. And I was like, yeah, I worked with him. What what up? He said, uh, they're looking for a photo double for him for a film coming out. It was the Back to the Future sequels, which had already been rumored were in pre-production. Right. And he said, I, I can't tell you. I'm not allowed to say. I was like... Get me in there. <laughs> it was it was the highest grossing film of eighty five. I knew yeah the sequels and the fact. And I remember in Variety and Hollywood Reporter the things the headlines were like back to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone involved has been paid enough to come back and reprise the role. <laughs> and uh, so I went in and met with the assistant directors and talked up you know my work with Clint and Michael Keaton and John Lithgow and. Tom DeLuise, all the people I've worked with. Yeah. And then they spoke with the director who sent me to casting. Okay. And I went to uh, Judy and Mike's and the, Jane's office and read the hanging the laundry scene from the first film. Yeah, yeah. And that went really well. And then they started sending me to makeup fittings and body cast fittings for special effects. And I was like, this is cool. Mm -hmm. And I started getting a hint at the, uh, did a screen test of the young George makeup. uh, And I figured they were putting me in the young George makeup because they needed George in multiple places at the same time. Like they did with Mike. Yes. And uh, at the screen test, Zemeckis said to Kundi, the cinematographer, what do you think, Dean? And Dean said, I think we got Crispin without the trouble. I was like, (laughs) <laughs> what's what's that mean? Uh, and it was actually my makeup artist who, next time I went in for another fitting or uh, application or something, he said, "You know, Crispin's out." Oh, okay. So you you had no idea up to George. that. I was like, "How are they? Gonna, there's no way they can make this without him." And how am I going to be George? Right. So what they basically were doing with this was they were going through a, a pro, pro protracted negotiation trying to get him in the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they didn't offer him, obviously, very much money, to, or at least they offered him less than Leah or, and, and Tom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he wanted script approval, I guess. And later I found out, of course, from sad stories from Crispin and, and stories while working with Bob Gale about abuses from both sides, how Bob made Crispin cry in front of some of the extras and how uh, they cut his hair without his permission and how they really uh, wouldn't let him be part of the creative process. Crispin and Leah had painted, made a painting and character together, and mm-hmm. Crispin brought it into Zemeckis and said, I want this on the wall in the McFly home, and, and Bob Z said, no way. <laughs> you know, wow. I've got an art director. I pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that for me. No. Yeah, right. Uh, and he threw his fit. You know, he threw a fit when Ken Chase tried to cut his hair mm-hmm. when he fell asleep in the makeup. Anyway, the story is on both sides, and I don't think they either wanted, wanted to necessarily... Uh, make allowances for the other. Yeah, yeah. And and in fact, the way Crispin tells it, they went down when he came back to them with things that he wanted. Mm-hmm. They kept lowering the rate that they were offering him because it was being more difficult. And, and you know, uh, a month ago or so, I was moving my office around and I found my old Paradox script. That's part two and part three in the same script. Yeah. And... Those scenes in 2015, I didn't have much time. I was thrown literally into production without <laughs> rehearsal or script readings or anything. Yeah. And I like, went through those scenes, had time, because I never went back to look at them. Yeah. Um, and I didn't use my own script. I was always using the scripts on set, the sides that were given me, because they changed daily. Yeah. And there were like eight versions of the <laughs> pizza scene. And <laughs> one of them, Marty, Marty is in the ortho lab hanging upside down. Oh, really? They didn't, want, I didn't know, they didn't know if they were going to have a George. <laughs> oh, you know, they, okay. They just had these different versions. Well, if we get George, this is what... If we don't get a George, or we get uh, someone who thinks they're George, these are the lines that we'll give them. <laughs> I remember uh, 
they were dividing up the scenes, the lines. Here, Leah, you take this one, and Mike, you take this one. I was like, hey, you guys, I'm an actor. I can I can deliver a line. I'm in there, aren't I? That's why I fought to get a few of those lines back. You know, mm-hmm. You're right. But, um, and I came up with a few. Like, uh, I was Granddad's Little Pumpkin in rehearsal because my head was butt level with Mike Marlene's stuffed orange hot pants. Yeah. <laughs> I look like a pumpkin. You know? <laughs> so it, it doesn't translate in other languages. It's like, how's granddad's little pigeon, I think, in one for... Oh, my God. <laughs> someone in Italy or Italy told me that recently, or Japan. It's very cool to hear my stuff dubbed in other languages. I love that. Oh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Now, I wish they'd do the deleted scenes. It was It was, like, already a huge success, but I feel like... As the years went on, it's become more iconic than ever. And I mean, oh, man. it's just insane to me. I mean, maybe not insane because it is such a perfect trilogy, but I mean, you, there's no way you could have known that this many years later you were going to be doing appearances at conventions and doing horror cons and comic cons and everybody was going to be back to the future crazy and wanting you to sign all these posters. I, I knew, we knew it was going to be a, a success. Yeah. Or, or we're hoping that it would be a success because it's, uh, it already had a following and everyone had big expectations. And the second film delivered. Yeah. Uh, they had enough money and production talent. I mean, friggin' top names in Hollywood in, in makeup and special effects. You know, Carter, who was production uh, designer on it, he's, Rick is now doing, uh, the Avatar sequels. I mean, he just, mm. all of them kept working. So I just kept, Dean Cundy kept working Jurassic Park and on, yeah. on and on. And so Scheidenberg was, the studio was, you know, delighted to get not one, but two when they decided to make two sequels yeah. so they could double their money. Yeah. And it's now rated as to one of the, the top 10 trilogies. Yeah. I like pinching myself. I'm so happy to, to, I had to negotiate my own screen credit on that. My agents were kind of weak, weak thrown in, at the 11th hour against the universal attorneys and the unscrupulous producers. And they didn't negotiate a good credit for me and then in credit producers discretion. I, I came to Zemeckis. I said, you know, I had a shared title credit on pale rider with Clint and other films. And stuff. Yeah. If anything less would be a step back in my career. Right. And so in Zemeckis very gentlemanly said, all right, I'll, I won't, I won't give you a single, I'll give you a shared title card. So I got a title card with James Tolkien. Mm-hmm. As soon as Bob Gale and Neil Canton heard that, they came running over to me wanting to slap me. So you don't want to talk to the director about that sort of I was like, he's the only one who seems to care about my career. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very, how do I say this, because of this makeup. Oh, wow. I wasn't allowed to promote myself. Yeah. And it was during production, I started really feeling like maybe there were they didn't have permission from, from Crispin to, to make me look like this. And this is a Polaroid, a continuity Polaroid for makeup that, that I kept. Yeah. That wow. I showed Crispin and, and it probably helped him with his case. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when that came out and also I had all these promotional things I was doing with my own career cut short and mysteriously disappear. And so I was like, I'm being, I'm being gaslit, blacklisted and shit. Wow. Um, so I wasn't really, how should I say, discovered until maybe 2008 or so by the fans. I started doing shows for the DeLorean owners. Uh-huh. And then I helped Crispin, you know, get his three quarters of a million dollars, but he never called to thank me. So it was like, what, what the hell? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so I started doing fan cons and the, and the cast reunions. And that has been the payoff for me and a trickle of residuals now and then. The, uh, Fan, especially the international fans. Uh-huh. You know, I, I have a good fan base here in the States, but some of my Italian fans and the English fans and the Japanese fans, are they're just nuts about me. I want to be my friend for life. <laughs> it's so so beautiful. I'm a real people person. I love people. When I worked at Universal, I learned specifically how to greet in 15 different languages. Oh, my God. Because I love people. And if you talk with people of other cultures who don't know yours or language, yeah. And you at least make the attempt. They open up and smile and sh- share their light. And I love that. Oh, my God. So, That's incredible. Now, with that being said, and you being a people person and all that, walk me through like what your first thoughts were the first time you did a con. 
Like, that had to be, like, a, a mind-blowing thing for you then, and you probably had a blast. I mean, I love going to cons, and I always have a blast, but to be the one in the chair with the line, and uh, well, I don't the know. First, the first one was not a con. It was a car show. Ah, huh, okay. My friend Dan found me out of obscurity, and he's the one who got me involved with the DeLorean owners, and he had invented a, a device you screw onto the stem of your tire, and when it spins, it lights up. It was called the tire fly. Okay. <laughs> And he had uh, a uh, Time Machine DeLorean appearing at his booth at a car show in Vegas, probably about 07 or so. I don't know. Might have been before that. Yeah, it might have been late 1990s. Oh, and wow. he had Tom Wilson set to come play for him. And when Tom heard that there was a DeLorean car- Time Machine going to be there, he didn't want to do it. Oh, really? So they wanted him with the Time Machine. Uh-huh. And at that point, I think Tom was bitter. I think he didn't get his overtime or something. I know Su- Leah had to sue for her overtime on Back to the Future. Oh, my God. Know. I didn't well, know all those stories. Anyway, it's not anything the public wants to know. But, but the thing was, Tom backed out of the car show at the last minute. And Dan, Dan Dutch called me up and said, well, are you available? What's your rate? And I gave him a rate, and he accepted it like that. And I was like, shit, I should have doubled it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so I'm the only other... Celebrity at this car show is, um, I'm going to forget his name. Uh, come on. It designed the Batmobile. Um, it had a line of, it did all the movie cars. Oh, okay. I remember right. he came over with his entourage to have a photo with me. Really? That's it amazing. Was so cool. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm blanking on his brain. I'm, I'm trying I'm, to find I'm, it right I'm now. <laughs> anyway, that was kind of my first celebrity appearance, and it had a picture of... You know, Back to Future Part 2 or the time, I forgot, the clock tower or whatever. Yeah. Or me from Part 2 in the Young George makeup. And most people who got in line to get an autographed picture said, well, you weren't George. I was like, well, yeah, I was. And like, no, you weren't. I'd have to <laughs> prove it to them, you know. And back then, I only had some black and white of, of me and the Young George makeup fighting with Biff. And yeah. like, now that's Chris. And I go, you think it is. Anyway, so that was kind of the first... And then the, like I mentioned, the DeLorean owners started having me come in to MC some of their conventions, their yearly get togethers. Yeah. And I'd help them run their auctions or entertain, even dress up as Charlie Chaplin and, and play. I almost got thrown out of one convention because the rumor was that some guy had crashed in his chaplain. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's strange things. And, and then slowly over the years, they'd adopt other Back to the Future alumni, uh, like Claudia Wells. Yeah. And then Chris Lloyd came, I remember the first time in. I think it was a show in either Chicago, the, the, the one in Dayton. The show in Dayton we did, a, a local high school came and premiered their version of the Back to the Future musical. Oh, okay. That's awesome. And, oh, the audience went nuts. And yeah. Bob Gale was in the audience. And, and Chris Lloyd, like I mentioned, another Harry Waters Jr., myself, Don Full of Love. And everyone's crying because it was so good. It was such a natural. Oh, that's and It was written by the high school drama coach. That's awesome. So Bob Gale was like, bing, this can't fail. This cannot fail. And so, of course, he's got his musical in London now. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, just get Sylvester to write the so, music. And uh, so it was then in 08, the Hollywood show had the first Back to the Future cast reunion uh-huh. with Chris and Leah. And, uh, Tom didn't come to that, but there were about, I want to say, 20 plus cast and crew members. Some of the special effects team, like Kevin Pike, came out. Mm-hmm. The Mike Clastorian, the the publisher, the pu- publicist rather. Uh, the uh, Elsa, the clock tower gal, was wonderful. Uh, uh, just passed away. Francis mm-hmm. Lee McCain, who I'd done some stage work with, was there. It was beautiful, and most of the crowd, of course, had lines to get Leah and Chris's autograph because you spent you have know, twenty celebs there, and you're spending forty bucks a piece or whatever. It's going to break you. So right. they go for the big names at that point. So most of us were twiddling our thumbs. <laughs> um, but on Sunday, it was very cool because one of the first book tours of Mike Fox's book happened to bring him to LA while that show was going on. And Mike showed up unannounced oh, wow. on that Sunday and he got mobbed. Oh, you know, true. we cast all got to the six main principles that were there. We spent about 20 minutes with Mike just chatting and getting to see him again. And it was really hard on all of us seeing how the Parkinson's was affecting him because we love Mike so much and, you know, it really makes him where he can't stand still or makes his body twist or whatever or drives him. And yeah, uh, yeah. 
So that was rough, but it was what it was. And, and he's still Mike, and he's still feisty and fantastic. <laughs> and we brought him back in, and he said, okay, we're going to lunch. Bye, Mike. And he turned to us like, what? <laughs> Fuck you guys. What? <laughs> and, and he got mobbed by 500 fans. You know, It was really fun. <laughs> so then, you know, over the years, we've done various larger and smaller reunions. Luckily, not so much for me in the States at first, Mm-hmm. But the but the London Film and Comic Con embraced me and took brought me over like to three different shows. Oh wow! And each one, I just I was had adoring fans all day long, and I have to pinch myself going, "Wow, this is wonderful!" Yeah, all my hard work and being in obscurity for so many years. I remember one of my I think my second time over, James Tolkien and I, I think Ricky Dean Logan and Claudia Wells maybe were the other celebs where James and I were the only celebs from Back to the Future. Mm-hmm. The main Star Trek star for that show was Leonard Nimoy. Oh, okay. And when Leonard, Leonard sauntered into the green room at, at noon and looked around, he came right over to, to James and I because Leonard and James had done a show together on stage directed by Otto Preminger. And just James, Leonard, and I sitting there chatting for a good 20 minutes or so, listening to them do their Otto Preminger impressions. <laughs> Because Otto would pick a whipping boy or girl for every show he was on film or stage. And he, on this one, picked Leonard Nimoy. And Leonard <laughs> wouldn't take that. He got up and he walked out. And it took him a couple hours, Otto, to get Leonard back to, before he started picking on someone else. But it was really great to listen to James and Leonard have these talks. And I was able to finally apologize to Leonard Nimoy for kicking sand on him when I was 11 years old on the beach at Play Del Rey. <laughs> So I wasn't watching where I was going, and I kicked sand on this guy, and, and he sat up and loaded his glass, and yeah, I was like, oh, it's Spock. And I ran home to tell my parents I kicked sand on Spock. <laughs> anyway, of course, he didn't remember it, but I did, and I got my I got to apologize. Full circle. Life comes full circle. God rest <laughs> him. Yeah. Well, I guess, okay, so staying on the topic of the, the conventions and stuff like that, are you also now seeing like fans bring you things besides Back to the Future? Like, are you signing... Um, you know, like Twilight Zone posters or... or oh, you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I just got back from New Jersey Horror Con. Yes. And yes. I had several people. So one guy brought the Twilight Zone soundtrack LP. Oh, wow. And, and he had uh, yeah, John Lithgow's autograph on it. Yeah. Who else did he have? He had a bunch of them. I was just, like, tickled. So I, I, and I sold a uh, rather signed... A few posters and photos from Twilight Zone at that show, which I was delighted because I had them with me. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, cosplay has been a delight for me. Seeing cosplay, I, I'm going to sh- bring something up here and share a screen that is totally, I think, worth it. Worth the price of admission. <laughs> There's the tiniest Doc Brown ever. Yes. I, I was like, Doc, you went too far back. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's adorable. I love uh, it. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to play. All right. And then there's. A female Marty, my friend Anissa Dame Fatali, who's an incredible cosplayer. She also does a fantastic spike, you know, from Griff, Griff's Gang. Oh, awesome. Yeah. As well <laughs> as awesome. uh, remarkable Disney villainesses. And uh, she's just a fantastic gal altogether. That's awesome. And Love so the hoverboard. Uh, crossing genres here with Doctor Who and yes. Time Travel with. <laughs> Back to the Future. Yes. For those listening, she this beautiful gal is dressed as Marty in the uh, junior. And yes. A midriff jacket. Right. And this this is the German Biff. <laughs> That's with, so uh, cool. Harry Waters and I at one of the London London shows. Yeah. I believe Sven. I believe his name is Sven. He owns. I believe he's one of the owners, or has something to do with Berlin Comic Con. Oh, okay. Very cool. Uh, my friends Terry and Oliver Holler, who are one of the first people to build their own Time Machine DeLoreans, and they've now traveled the world and raised over a million dollars for Mike's charity. Wow. Uh, They put on an event up in uh, Columbia, which is right next to Sonora, near where they shot Part 3. And they call it, we're going uh, back back to 1885. And example, this couple, the little kid on the box here in the middle with the bowler hat, the gal next to him, they came from Russia. People come from all over the world to be a part of this and a four or five days celebration of Back to the Future Part 3 and raise money for, for the charity. <laughs> My friend Shannon, they play uh, uh, Marty at conventions all the time raising money. Yeah. I They're incredible. It. This group uh, gets to go. This is another event called We're Going Back. Every five years, people come in from around the world and do uh, all the 
locations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one location you can ride a hoverboard. Another one you uh, do your enchantment under the sea dance with a lot of the stars present. I that's know, me and I that's so it. cool. I, I put a band together. I played uh, guitar at that event behind Harry Waters with a band called Flux Capacitors. <laughs> I've heard of that. I, I put a band together called Mr. Fusion for the Back to the Future cruise that was made up of all alumni from the films. Yeah. This is my only cosplay. For those of you, of you at home who aren't looking or can't see it, a Danish <laughs> daddy became dressed himself in a, is it called Bokunru? The like Japanese puppeteering. Yeah. He's all in black, but his head is, he's actually the ortholev that I wore in part two, hanging upside down. And his one-year-old boy was turned upside down for 10 seconds dressed as old George McFly with the hair and everything. So he, <laughs> if you can look it up online, a lot of people say, oh, that's child battery. And the kid was upside down for maybe 10 seconds. He, he lived. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's so cool, though. Oh, my God. So here's, here's that same uh, gal as Spike, as you can tell. Oh, yeah. Uh, she's a good Spike. And the guy <laughs> playing Griff is a uber Back to the Future fan named Brad Fife, who made me, uh, let's see if I can find it here, my first action figure. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, can, uh, can you see it? Yeah. Oh, my God. That's really good. He must have 3D printed it or something. It's, yeah. It's awesome. So there are a couple artists out there doing it, but it's not mass produced. Not yet. Now, how long were you actually hanging upside down to shoot that scene? All day. Were you really? I mean, I can imagine. I mean, I only learned really a couple months ago that the reason they had George hang upside down, there's this urban legend out there. Oh, they hung him upside down to obscure that it was a different actor. Uh And I was like, no, it was in the script well before I came on the, on the scene. Yeah. But it, the story behind it apparently is that Crispin would often under hit, under overshoot his marks or under hit them. Okay. <laughs> so he wouldn't be in camera focus. Uh, so they got tired of that, and Zemeckis and, and uh, Gail wrote this Ortholev thing so they could have him on a track, <laughs> be able to stop him and start him when they needed him to move for camera marks. <laughs> And also to torture him, uh, because I remember one crew guy came up to me while I was hanging upside down and said, you know, all this torture was meant for Crispin. I was like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, and some of my days, it took us over two weeks, a two-week period, because we couldn't shoot all the time. We only had Michael uh, some evenings and weekends, mm-hmm. because he was shooting the last season of Family Ties during the day. Oh, okay. So we would have these really long, long days if we could get Michael on a day off and an evening, and we would shoot straight through. Yeah. So one week I had a 19-hour day. Remember, it took four hours just to put any of the makeups on. Right. Another hour to take it off at the end of the day. And I'd be hung upside down 19 hours, 21 hours. One day was 26 hours long. Oh, my God. You must have had the biggest headache on the planet when you're, when you're filming this, this movie at that and, point. And a backache, too. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> So I've become very good friends with Dean Cundy, our cinematographer pictured here with the beard. Okay. And then uh, Wild Bob, uh, Dangerous Bob. Dangerous Bob Wielden was one of the main prop guys. who He and he designed the license plate and the, and the Pizza Hut foil and <laughs> these different things. Great stuff. Yeah. And Marvin McIntyre, who played The Undertaker in Part 3. Yes. <laughs> They're in his outfit for the Back to 1885 event. Well, Marvin and I had worked together previously on Pale Rider. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. It was, it was really cool. And I, I, from time to time, played Doc Brown, as you can see here. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, actually. didn't? It, wasn't it like a Back to the Future short that you that you <laughs> Oh, yeah. I did, uh, yeah, I did a fun short. That was one of the first times I ever played Doc. Um, <laughs> I've gotten better. Anyway, it, it you know, satisfies my need to cosplay. I uh, love dressing up. You should see my lobster man. I think I have a picture in here of it. Um, <laughs> These are the Japanese Back to the Future fans doing a Zoom with them. Oh, my God. And they all dressed up as characters, as you can see. Yeah, okay. yeah. I love the, so we'll the guy with the off. flux capacitor behind it, or the <laughs> the date board behind him from the DeLorean. I'm, I'm big in Japan. <laughs> it's funny, because I've, I've never met any of the cast of Back to the Future, but my son also loves Back to the Future. He just turned 11, and a few years ago, I took him to a con, and they had the DeLorean. So, of course, he had to drive it while I stood on the hoverboard, because, you know, 
dad wasn't, you know, nope, you can't get in the car, dad. You got to stay out of the car. I want to drive the car. And he was so thrilled and it's framed hanging in his bedroom right now because even like that next generation coming up already loves Back to the Future. It's just amazing. It's delightful that generation after generation, I, uh, a couple months ago, did a private Zoom with a uh, terminally ill 11-year-old in uh, the UK. Mm. And to see him, you know, he was definitely weakened and and was, you know, nigh. Uh, he became vital and so excited and animated and his parents <laughs> just loved it. And, uh, it really is amazing, the power of celebrity. I, I uh, often do charities. My wife and I, like I mentioned, produced a Back to the Future cruise to Ann Parkinson's. This is her in the jumpsuit. Oh, okay. Uh, I put on a, my first charity for her. Uh, she had five brain tumors, and I uh, had, did something for her health fund mm -hmm. and got a lot of good top-name comedians and bands to play. And then I do improv, so I had a bunch of a giant improv jam with a lot of improv legends. Yeah. And uh, that was kind of a test, I guess, for putting on this cruise, which was insanity. Neither <laughs> of us had produced a cruise before, and I had asked the guy who does one of the Star Trek cruises to help me. Many years ago, I had the idea for it. And he said, nah, you're getting in over your head. You don't want to do it, blah, blah. Forget, forget about it. Yeah. And about, you know, for the 2015 anniversary, I called him again. And I said, you know, and this was a year or two before. I said, I still want to do this cruise. I'd like to get your advice. And he said, you know what? I'll help you. My dad's now got Parkinson's. Oh, and I'll wow. do whatever I can to help you. And he actually merged his Star Trek cruise with my cruise because I didn't sell enough tickets. I only had about 50 Back to the Future fans on my cruise. Mm. But we still, with by merging the Star Trek cruise, and we had Kevin Pike and uh, Andrew Probert, who designed the Time Machine DeLorean, yeah. and Kevin Pike, who was special effects, both did crossover work into Star Trek. So it was kind of a win-win, and then their star, Von, Von Scott? No, Von... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> He's been in, like, every incarnation of Star Trek. He played with Mr. Fusion, my band, at our, in gym and under the sea dance. Oh, okay. <laughs> so here I am, hoverboarding. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I really and hope... We, we raised about 10 grand. That's amazing. And that's like something that's like near and dear to my heart. I just this year lost my grandfather to Parkinson's. And oh. so that's, you know, like I, I'm donating money for his birthday coming up in December to the cause as well. So like hearing that you raised so much money for it is so amazing. Far out. I was having my uh, suit fitted to play Mark Twain. It's a recent project. I, I played Mark Twain in a PBS movie about 10 years ago. Yeah. And I'm developing a series called Mark Twain's American History. And when I was having my suit uh, fitted, the seamstress said, my friends and I dressed up as Christopher Lloyd's characters from all his movies for <laughs> Halloween. I said, oh, I'd, I'd love to tell me more. And she goes, oh, I got a photo. And she showed me the photo and I was like, give me two copies. <laughs> And she did, and I took it to the next show I saw Chris Lloyd at, and here it is. You can see Chris signed it for her. Oh, that's it, that's incredible. I love the Who Framed Roger Rabbit there in the middle. <laughs> There's actually two of them. There's side by side. There's oh, Judge yeah. Doom uh, human version and then Judge Doom cartoon version. Yeah, yeah. That's so The cool. power of celebrity. <laughs> yeah, I found uh, Chris, you know, he was very silent while we were shooting the films. I asked Mike Mills, who is my main makeup guy, he was the foreman on Beetlejuice, done so many great works. I, can you introduce me to Chris? I'm such a big fan. He said, come come by next week while we're shooting Hill Valley Exterior 2015. About three in the morning, I'm hanging out in the makeup trailer, and finally Chris comes in, and Mike introduces us, and it's like, Mr. Lloyd, I'm a big fan. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and we stood there kind of staring and not doing much for the next five or ten minutes, and I was like, okay, I got to go. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to meet him and so flash forward you know freaking uh, 14 years later yeah. he and I are guests for a trilogy showing of the trilogy at the New Beverly C Cinema in Beverly Hills and they stick us in the in the projectionist booth for 40 minutes before we come down to introduce yeah. films and Claudia's been there with us but she hasn't arrived yet and so it was in a projectionist booth that I finally got to have a nice conversation with Chris and he finally <laughs> opened up and learned that he likes exotic plants. So the next time I saw him, I gifted him with a rare B-52 bomber Venus flytrap. I was like, Chris, 
a year or so later after seeing him after getting, doing the plan, he was like, oh, oh I love this. <laughs> yeah, a year later, how's that B-52 bomber? Is it, I killed it. <laughs> I'm never home. You know, you do a really good Christopher Lloyd voice. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> Great shot. Bye. <laughs> This is me as a medicine man there at the 1885. Oh, yeah. Event. That's awesome. And some fun fun gags. So that's the uh, the cosplay slideshow. I have, uh, well, I go on forever on, on this stuff because, like I said, it's luckily plucked me out of going crazy. And as soon as the pandemic hit, I was like, what the hell? <laughs> uh, or I, as soon as I found out I was kind of uh, blacklisted, my life uh, took a terrible turn. Mm. I had... Uh, to tell an, an actor who's depending on his acting that he, he's no longer welcome at a studio. It's like, holy shit. Mm-hmm. And I, my first marriage fell apart. I had, I had to get out of LA, but luckily I, I remet, I overcame those, the PTSD from all that and uh, remet my junior high sweetheart and we got married and moved North. And while working in theater and independent film up here uh, in the Bay area is Sometimes, uh, you know, I, I work sometimes, not off, all the time. Yeah. Uh, the fan cons help supplement that. And that's a, a major blessing. Yeah. And or uh, even the, with the pandemic, there were the, the, the advent of virtual cons. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I had uh, one of the first things I, after lockdown, a friend of mine on Facebook announced that they, that a company out of England was going to produce his version of, excerpts from his version of Back to the Future as if Shakespeare had written it called Get Thee Back. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I said, is this still Ian? Is this still casting? I don't know. Here's the casting. And I uh, let them know who I am and they were like, I was, are you still casting? Of course. What What part do you want? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Doc Brown. And you got it. So they cast me as Doc Brown in their first, one of their first virtual Zoom productions. Oh, wow. And we did Back to the Future as if Shakespeare had written it. And you can look, see it on YouTube for free. Really? Called Get Thee Back. And I played Doc Brown, did the slide from the clock tower in my living room and uh, climbing up the wall and everything. My wife was my costumer and special effects person, camera person, and yeah. art director. It, we worked really hard. And it came out great. I think it came out great. And I also, they later on had already decided they were going to zoom all of Shakespeare's canon. Over the summer, they did a different play uh, every couple of weeks. Yeah, every week. Yeah, really, literally three days of rehearsal to do it, and and I was their Sir Toby Belch in their Twelfth Night, which you can see on YouTube as well. They're called the Show Must Go Online. T S M G O. I'll have to uh, put the link in the show notes, so anybody listening to this right now, go through the show notes, and you'll find the link for these. And that's what's kind of helped me keep from going crazy during. You know, I've lost. Eighty thousand dollars worth of film work and uh, fan cons and yeah. all gigs due to the pandemic. Mm-hmm. They're starting to trickle back. Yeah, but I was more than the financial was. I needed to do something creatively. Yeah, with the emotional waves of the first three months of the American onset of the pandemic. I lost a cousin every month who died. Oh my god! And people around me are still not taking it seriously. I'm going, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. This is really happening, you guys. Please take it seriously. I've had fans writing me early from uh, South China and uh, North Italy mm-hmm. because it turns out in Bologna, where I was supposed to go for StarCon, Peter Weller and I were the main stars at it. It was also the, the seat of the textiles up there and all their workers come from Wuhan. So they were bringing the pandemic directly to North Italy. That's oh how... My God. The more trucks got lined up up there so quickly. Yeah. Anyway, so it's, uh, so, you know, Lee Ehrenberg from the Pirates of the Caribbean movies? Yes, yeah. He's an old friend of mine. We did children's theater together. So, so we went to high school, same high school in Santa Monica, and Ron Campbell, who uh, helped start the Actors Gang with uh, Tim Robbins and uh, Matt Walker, another wonderful comedian. We all went to the same high school, and we got together as thespians in a Zoom from our high school trying to figure out what is next for us, we decided to do a pandemic version of Waiting for Godot. Okay. Calling it Zooming for Godot. <laughs> and every time we'd write it and tape it, it, things would have changed because it had to be very, we thought, up to date with pandemic, but things with pandemic changed by the day. Yeah. 
For sure. And so I was lucky, and I wrote this whole tirade and stuff that goes on for 13 pages. And uh, by the time I got it shot and ready to edit in, all the numbers had changed and all the players had changed. It was crazy. Yeah. Uh, it really came out great, but we haven't released it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so is, so is there plans trying to? trying to figure out what to do with it. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a fundraiser. Well, now, didn't you also uh, play George McFly again in a fan, like a fan film remake of Back to the Future? Yeah, that was, just, uh, again, uh, the pandemic. Uh, fans needed something to keep themselves occupied. So Taylor Morton, the director and writer and director of the documentary and the last blockbuster. Oh, yeah. He decided he was going to remake... Back to the Future Part 2 in 88 scenes, 88 miles an hour. Got it. And he first got only filmmakers, and then he didn't have enough filmmaker buddies, so he opened it up to fans Mm -hmm. and got divvied up 88 scenes and had people around the world make that scene. Oh, okay. With whatever they had. So there are animals, there are sock puppets, there are... Your children were playing all the different roles in the different scenes, and it's magnificent. And he edited it all together, and it's on YouTube for free. And that one's called Project 88. Okay, I'll check that out. Back in the Future Part 2. And did I play George in that? I think I did a scene, a quick scene as as George in that. And then the wonderful little Poppy and Ari, this couple, Ari I think is 16 or 17, and Poppy's not much older, and she's over in the UK. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ari's here in the States. And they spearheaded remaking part one. Oh, okay. So I did a scene for them. And I believe Kevin Bosch, who's a super fan of Back to the Future, is spearheading a remake, fan remake of part three right now. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, that's going to be really it's cool. It's heartfelt. It's totally uneven. You got some, like, oh my God, these, what do these people do? Some are super psychedelic. Some are ridiculously funny. Some are in different languages. It's quite fun. <laughs> I'm going to have to check that out and link it in the show notes also. So again, if you guys are listening, there's going to be a lot of links in the show notes. So uh, make sure you check that out and I'll put them in the show notes on the YouTube video too. It's going to take a lot of links to do the show. <laughs> and it, it seems like you have a good relationship still with Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd and Leah Thompson because I see pictures that you post of, of all of you at the cons when you're all there together too. Oh, yeah, boy, it's kind of like a family reunion. Yeah. You know, cousins. <laughs> but I I don't see Mike that often. I last time was 2015, so it's been six years. Oh wow, okay. Though he was friendly as can be, and mm-hmm. and it was wonderful to see him as usual. Leah, I see about well, the, we saw each other in a, a Galaxy Con panel uh, about three months ago. Oh, okay. And I write, I send her his stuff. If I see something that looks like it might not be her autograph. I said, Leah. Plus these people, if they're faking your <laughs> autograph or whatever. I'd love to work with her. She's directing all the time. She's been directing Picard mm-hmm. and other TV series. And uh, I have seen Dean, Dean Cundy every so often. He, he comes up to visit me in the wine country. I'll take him out wine tasting. Oh, very cool. And he loves it. Dean is, and his wife, Tisha, are just beautiful, wonderful people. And uh, like I said, uh, in New, New Jersey this last weekend, I was hanging with Harry Don and Claudia. Yeah, that's awesome. I saw the I saw the uh, some of the pictures from that, and uh, I have to get to one of those. So I've I've been to plenty of cons, but I've never been to anywhere there's anybody from Back to the Future. Just the car. <laughs> at, at this one was the debut of Timothy. I think his name is Timothy Mitchell, a friend of the Shays who on the Back to the Future Part Three time machine. He built Marty's truck and debuted for the first time. I don't know anyone else who's done it. The re-elect Goldie Wilson for mayor van. Oh wow! With the speakers and the recording going on, and it's <laughs> fantastic. We were thrilled. Don full of seeing it for the first time, nearly wet his pants. I'm so sure. delighted. He's like, "This is hilarious!" And he just milked it. He's got great video on Goldie Wilson's page. Go check it out. That's fantastic. Well, since we're talking about pages and cons and appearances, why don't you take the time now to plug your social media so everybody can jump on there and follow you and find sure, out. follow you. me. Keep following me or I'll call a cop. <laughs> Let them know. Oh, that didn't come out right. <laughs> I uh, On Instagram, it's at Jeffrey, and Jeffrey is J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, not E-R-Y, like a lot of people spell. Jeffrey J. Weissman, and Twitter at Jeff, J-E-F, one F, Weissman, W-E-I-S-S-M-A-N. Uh, my fan page on Facebook is at Jeffrey Weissman Actor. My personal page has been at the 5,000 limit for 10 years. 
<laughs> so there's a line of over 600 people who refuse to not become my friend. And, and I'm like, okay, so I'll find an inactive and then add someone. But it, Facebook does not make it easy. Ugh. Yeah, I might be leaving it too because of all the political mishigas. Right. Um, and what else do I have? I've got a TikTok and I've only posted a few silly videos, mostly of my cat. Um, <laughs> my cat has his own IMDb page. Check him out. Really? Yeah, under his whole name, Ramsey's Cat Hotep Kitty Uncommon. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Check him out. He's there. He loves to see his numbers come down. Absolutely. I love to see my numbers come down. Visit my IMDb. When my numbers come down, I feel like I'm important. <laughs> I, well, you are important. You're part of Back to the Future. You're yeah, part of I'm Twilight Zone. Of my own mind. Yeah. <laughs> you worked with Clint Eastwood. I mean, what else do you want? Like, that's fantastic stuff. <laughs> I have a lot of stories of all these different. I'm hoping that you know the, the there's talk of me coming in for a Scarecrow and Mrs. King convention, uh, and a Saved by the Bell event. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, since I was Screech's guru on that, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Twilight Zone reunion. I still want to do one. I tried to do a Pale Rider reunion. In fact, I thought I had Richard Keel there, and it was two weeks before he died. Oh, wow. But uh, anyway, so I'm hoping that there are other reunions in the future. I don't have anything uh, solid yet. I'm talking about something in March in Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, North Italy, trying to get that back on track in May. But uh, like I say, visit my pages. Also, backtothefuture.com tries to keep up with everyone's appearances in the cast. So if you have a poster you're trying to get everyone to sign, you know, sometimes there's going to be these reunions that where a bunch of us, especially since hopefully people are being uh, careful with the pandemic, being mm-hmm. vaccinated. You know, I'm kind of quarantined right now because I, I don't know who may have had something that I just dealt with. So I'm keeping right. a little while. Right, right. Even though I'm vaccinated and boosted, damn it. Being, you know, a, feel fine. being extra safe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jeffrey, man, thank you so much for doing this. I, I can't thank you enough. I enjoyed the hell out of it. I loved the pictures and just being able to chat with you about it. I It was one of my first favorite movies as a kid. I, I just remember being like five years old and pulling the VHSs out of my, my uncle's cabinet and being like, what's this? And popping them in. And then ever since then, I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Signed two VHS copies at the show this weekend. Did you really? I- yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, the show before that, there was laser discs. It was very cool. I have two things to promote. I'm about to open as the MC of a th- the music stage at the Charles Dickens Christmas Fair drive through. So Dickens drive through uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area will be the uh, first three weekends of December. Excellent. So bring car car of your friends up to seven people for twenty five bucks and come see all this entertainment. Uh, it's going to be fun. Victorian Christmas. And uh, once again, it was something else. The, the uh, Mark Twain project uh, is in development. I just released uh, a lecture on the Center for Mark Twain Studies website on my journey to becoming Mark Twain and the, the series that I'm developing. Excellent. Very cool. Oh, so, more links. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, uh, I, I looked up the guy who designed the Batmobile. Was it uh, George Barris? George Barris and his entourage. All right. And just, then, you know, he came over to have a picture with me, and I was like, I want to kiss your feet. You want to <laughs> have a picture with me? <laughs> you know, he had gra- Grandpa Munster's, or no, Grandpa, uh, yeah, the, Grandpa Munster's hot rod. Yes. And there's so many iconic, wonderful cars that he designed. I didn't know uh, he did that. That's awesome. And just just because you brought up the Munsters a couple times, I'll show you this. Look out. Oh, <laughs> Nice. I'm a huge... Yvonne DiCarlo. Yeah, huge Monsters fan over here. So, again, thank you so much for being here, man. And you took a nice chunk of your day out to talk to me, which I can't thank you enough for, so I appreciate it. It was fun. And, uh, you know, Robbie, check in from time to time, and hopefully we'll meet up at one of the conventions or something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I've got a a couple films that are doing the festival circuit now, one called The Carnival of Wonders, Mm -hmm. in which I play the embodiment of death that has a little girl kind of stuck in between life and death and waiting to help her whichever direction she, she chooses to, to take. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, directed and choreographed by uh, Madonna's old choreographer. And there are these incredible dance numbers in it. And I'm like the thread that keeps these numbers together. It's real fun. It's winning all sorts of awards called Carnival of Wonders. Mm-hmm. It's only about 20 minutes long. And then I've got another film that a kid that I kind of mentored, kind of protege, helped him with his writing called... Uh, the Eden Theory, Kyle Mysex, and his short 
Autumn Girl just took the gold at Cannes Shorts Film Festival, and his first feature, The Eden Theory, is has just gotten distribution. Fantastic. So I've got a nice part in that. Awesome. So we, we like to work. Yeah, absolutely. So my cat. My cat loves to work too. <laughs> We're just going to clip those, that like thirty seconds there, and just keep putting that on every every social <laughs> media. <laughs> Weissman needs work. <laughs> oh, man. All right, listeners, thank you once again, and I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I enjoyed doing it. And once again, please hit that subscribe button, send the podcast to your friends, and let's get those follows and likes going. And we will catch you next week with another brand new episode of the All Bets Are Off podcast. The preceding presentation has been brought to you by the Gear Network.